So basically what I'd like to talk about is uh, some of the tools that we have through the CMC. Uh, one of the biggest ones, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, is our BoomWatch app development. Uh, this is a phone app that we've developed several years ago. Its original purpose was based on feedback we got from state uh, water quality folks was they needed a way to get quick um, notification of HABs that were occurring, sound of bacteria blooms that were occurring in their state, and possibly a way that they wouldn't have to travel three hours or so to get to that site to find out that, well, it's not there anymore, or it was a, you know, just a regular algae bloom or something like that. Um, I always do well with these. So it was a quick, quick alert um, um, approach that we wanted to develop into a simple phone app. And again, looking at very simple tools for sound management monitoring collaborative tools that were inexpensive to use but really useful. Uh, I should mention the website that we have. Shane developed that for us in the CMC. It's used quite a bit. I think it cost him 20 bucks to get up online and running. So again, we're we're pretty uh, frugal, I guess, with, with funding. Uh, so the simple purpose was document these blooms, get geo-referenced images uh, through a cell phone app. And a common tool that was useful that everybody has, basically, your cell phone. We knew everybody had one of these, or most people in the world do. Um, it's a tool that anyone out walking their dog, anyone that goes on their dock for a cup of coffee in the morning, uh, has on hand usually with them. Uh, and it's a great way to get crowdsourced data, green pooling in this data <coughs> at a statewide level. So I just threw the state of Maine up here just as an example. If someone gets a call at the state of Maine, D DEP to look at a bloom, it's going to take them a long time to get from uh, Portland up to maybe Fort Kent. So it's likely going to be gone by then. Right. So we got this out. Uh, I was able to get some funding together to get some research developers uh, in Corvallis to put the app together for us. They're actually the same people that developed the apps for all our uh, national uh, uh, resource surveys for EPA. And they put it together, we, we put it out there for a couple of years, we waited to get feedback. And pretty much the feedback when after a year or so out there was, eh, well, <laughs> I hate to say it, but that's the way I felt. I was a little, uh, a little deflated by it. But I started to think, okay, well, what's, why isn't it getting much more use? You know, it's a great tool. I mean, it's the first time I've ever used a smartphone and I love this thing, um, no feedback. So, um, I think one of the problems was we, we looked at, okay, when you use that app and you submit your images, it only went out to that one state contact. So it's, it had very extremely limited utility in, the, in that. Um, we didn't have the ability, you know, we got, I started to get calls in from, from folks that, well, we want to use it up in the uh, remote mountain lakes of Colorado and, and how do we use it for detecting blooms there if I have to just send it to one state contact? Uh, it really wasn't that useful. And then once the images are submitted, well, then what? You know, what do you do if you don't respond to, the, to a state, state response to it? Um, so again, uh, the image base, we thought, oh, it's great. Person can use it. Uh, health person or a person from the state to see what the magnitude is of this bloom and the location of the bloom. Um, so a big difference between those two sites. It might be important for someone to know that um, quickly. So. Bloom Watch, we developed the app, and like I said, we got kind of the eh response. Uh, so, based on the feedback, uh, we decided to try some new steps. And uh, one of them was, of course, for me, I had to, you know, the developer said, well, show me the money. <laughs> so, we know as EPA, money is a tough thing to come by for just about everybody these days. So, actually, it wasn't until this past June, several years after we developed the app, that we were able to get some funds through some folks in headquarters. Uh, thank you very much to the headquarters folks, the innovation grants to really um, promote the app and some other uh, details, which I'll show you in a minute. So with that, this thing keeps moving on me. We decided to expand the, the app. Those of you, everybody has it on their phone right now, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, but basically what it is, you get on the phone, you, you fill out some uh, information, you put your water body in there, you take three different images, one kind of a broad perspective, how much of the water body is under a bloom condition. Is it lake wide? Is it just along the shoreline? Is it just a little you know, area the size of a you know, sedan or something like that? So you put that in, then when you submit those images, off they go to the state contact. 
right now there's 28 states that are involved in this program that have the have it up and will receive the images if they decide to send them. But again, that just went to one uh, one contact. So now we've changed the Boom Watch. It's in development as we speak, where you can add your own custom email list. So if you have a lake association like Winpasaki, where you're interested in what's going on in different areas of the lake. You can get that email list together. You can instantly send that, oh, we just had a bloom on this bay during this time period. And it's gonna document everything, geo-reference, timestamp, and the images. So you can see the extent of it, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So that was a real huge uh, component, I think, and it's gonna be a big upset. Hopefully we'll see uh, much more use of the app at that point, once that's up and running. So this is where we have after, um, uh, two or three years of using the Bloomwatch app. These are where they've been taken. Not not a lot of use in my uh, estimation. Uh, of course, New England, and then we got some little concentrated hubs that use it. Uh, in Idaho, there's a group out there that uses it a fair amount. And there's interest in uh, in Washington State as well, a little bit down in Louisiana. So it'd really be nice to see it used more. Um, and one of the big things I think about the Bloomwatch app that makes it so important is that even in New England, even though all the work we've done, and, and Kristen mentioned, this is never going to stop. Uh, <laughs> as Kristen mentioned earlier, we kind of have this, you know, well, we kind of know that a lot of blooms happened last year. Maybe a few of them happened on water buys that we never knew happened on before. But we don't have the data to confirm that necessarily. We have this kind of white noise that I hear all the time in my job that, oh, yeah, we had a bloom on this lake. It's 80 feet deep. First time it's ever bloomed. You know, and you hear it in Maine, you hear it in Connecticut. But how do we document? How can we show a timestamp or, or show that we have these patterns existing on a larger scale than just that certain water body? Um, so that's where the utility of the tool, I think, comes in. Um, so with that uh, information, um, we have some money that we were able to hire some developers to look at new ways to visualize data. And basically, I borrowed a lot of the, the state cyanobacteria data in the individual states um, to do. Is there a pause on this thing? <laughs> uh, borrowed the data from the individual states to just kind of see how can we look at data and maybe look at it in, in more of a dynamic fashion and get more insights to it. Um, as a person that's worked on water quality issues as a federal level and a state person for 20, 25 years now, one thing that's uh, really been apparent and is the reason why the National Aquatic Surveys began is because every state and every organization has their own monitoring techniques and methods and they serve specific purposes but if you want to aggregate up to larger scales you need consistency in your data collection methodologies and your approaches and that was one big thing that we tried to do with the collaborative when we first started out specific methods we put the kit out uh, because it had specific tools certain um, mesh size, all these little things that add the quality assurance and the consistency across the region for anyone using that kit that makes it really useful. So you can use it at the local scale and you can also use it at a much larger um, spatial scale than that. So this is just an example of some cyanobacteria sites in Maine from the Maine's data, um, thanks to Linda Bacon at Maine DEP. And it just shows the um, frequency of occurrence of, of lakes, water bodies that have had um, cyanobacteria blooms and the the risk based on phosphorus levels um, but this is a i just found out last year there's a software in in a whole user group within epa called a click user group and the click is like tableau if any of you guys are familiar with tableau it's basically a dynamic filtering tool for for database you can pull in any kind of data you want into this system show a ton of different types of graphics and then in real time just filter on the parameters that you want to look at um, so we could go in, into this data and i could click i say okay we just want to look at uh, all the all the lakes that showed sound of bacteria blooms in 2018 they would pop up immediately in front of me um, you can say okay i want to look at all the lakes through time that happened since we started monitoring cyanobacteria and it's going to show you that um, so it's very dynamic and very useful and gives you some great insights uh, for some of that other ways to look at data, um, are some of these are just dashboard examples, things that you build that are dynamic with the data that you have. Um, so uh, as an example from some of the data that I've borrowed from around the states, uh, this is called the heat map here. 
we've taken Rhode Island's data from URI and their volunteer monitoring, and we've listed all the lakes that they have in the region, all the years across this way that they've been monitoring, and then set a color code based on some threshold value of whether it's phosphorus levels or something like that. And you can immediately look at all the data they've collected over all the years and see where those hotspots are. So, so it's kind of a real useful and interesting tool. And these are just examples of different forms of uh, graphics that you can use as well. Um, so since I have probably about 30 seconds left, um, really kind of pushing the bloom watch. I'm not a great salesman, but I can <laughs> try to get people to put it on their phone and use it so we can get that information. Um, we are willing to this summer to do analysis on water samples as long as it's accompanied by a bloom watch image with it. Um, we have possibilities, we buy a new uh, tool that looks at all different algae composition within a, a, a water sample. We have an ELISA system plate reader that's been sitting in our lab for two years, which this year we're gonna get up and running. This will help push me along that path. We have fluorescence tools for people to use. And the end result is to take that data develop kind of a, a pilot program, you would say, for getting everybody more involved across the region with this, with this program and, and the cyanobacteria issue. Um, and then uploading stuff into cyanos.org to you. So uh, this afternoon for tomorrow, uh, basically we're looking at a, um, this is kind of a primer for the breakout session this afternoon, but also tomorrow looking at, um, trying to help get some ideas on the biggest issues and how we can pull this together and really make something work across the region with it. So that's kind of my hope and I think a few others. Um, and we'll see if it's, we're thinking on the same wavelength and just something we're engaging. So if you are, make sure you show up tomorrow and certainly this afternoon. Um, so that's all I have. I think any questions.